put out. We're recording. That also means that when we have some participatory parts of this, I may repeat things that you say. It's for the benefit of uh, our friends that have had with us. So I don't think I'm crazy. Um, I think this is honestly the third or fourth time given this talk, particularly for a journal. They seem to love selecting the session, so I hope that you all enjoy it. Um, I think that these are all about starting conversations, so I welcome that. Um, there will be parts, uh, chances for you to participate. I also will actually be making myself available after this to talk more about the topic. I'm very passionate about it. We can only really cover one facet of it when we have so much time together today. But there's like an umbrella of things that I think that we need to bring back to the workplace and we're going to start with authenticity. So, um, what, what year is it? Uh, it's 2024, beginning January 8th, 2023. Um, welcome, come on in. So January uh, 8th, 2023, the American President Ronald Reagan. 20 boys, thank you. Um, I'm a little biased, but I think that they're the cutest babies ever born. Um, pregnancy was the absolutely worst thing to ever happen in my life. But birth and these babies, we'll take it. Um, this is Xavier. On your left, and he was born a whopping seven minutes before his brother Jackson on the right. And uh, so I was thrust, me and my husband, just into first time parenthood and his twins, and all of the uh, beautiful, awful, that's what we've coined it, uh, that comes along with it. Um, and it was, it was a great time. My husband went back to work after three days of America. I was off for quite a bit longer, thank you to uh, my progressive job at the time. And uh, my mom came to help. Um, I of Jacob descent, and that's kind of something that we do in our culture. Mom moves in uh, for a little bit to help this transition, which, my goodness, um, a blessing. So we were at home with all the new things, and because she was there, she was taking pictures every day. I was sleeping, but we were, <laughs> she had little, they were so tiny, four or five pounds. Um, what a time. Um, and so they had little photo shoots every day when I was very young. She's like our family uh, photographer, so she, she was very big in her photos. And because they got to look like this, I like this. <laughs> and it was looking like this, probably a bit more on the inside than the outside, that I went back to work. And work stops for no one, so I went back immediately back in the deep end. Um, all of the client calls, all of the operational meetings, all of the multitasking. Um, and it was with this that I went into uh, one of my first client calls back. The team of the client did not see eye to eye on something. I was sent in to, to figure out uh, what was going on and get some feedback from the client that I could hopefully see that what was happening. And I woke up and postpartum me was always on big dreams covered my face and I put on this, this mask of everything is, is great that we all know so well. And I was killed, not a lie. I got on, I looked like I had all the energy in the world, I didn't, I was laughing, I was making jokes that were landing. It was going great, what about, I don't know, maybe not even halfway, because we weren't even to meet to what we were talking about. Maybe halfway through our pleasantries and, and reacquainting ourselves with each other, I hit a wall. And when you're in the middle of this conversation, I was fully engaged, and it's like my brain completely shut off. And suddenly, everything she was saying sounded like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. I, I couldn't. And so uh, there was a moment where she stopped talking, and it, probably because she asked me a question. I, I have no idea to this day what, what, what actually happened. Um, and I had a choice. I could regroup in a, a millisecond. We, we can do that. We, we've all been professionals for a long time and continue going. Or I could, I could let it go for a minute so that I could truly regroup and truly be back to the engagement in the conversation. And I gotta tell you, in this particular moment, it was not a choice. I, I didn't have much left, and so I, I let it go. Here's what we're learning. The traditional uh, norms or guidelines or rules of professionalism that we all come up with 
are having a negative impact on the way that we are living our lives and on the way that we are doing work. So let's talk a bit about traditional professionalism and its effect on us today. And I'll come back to that story. That was what I just wanted to hear. So essentially in the 1800s, uh, well, this quote here is from the Encyclopedia of Canada, and it, it's just defining what professionalism was at its onset. And it was characterized uh, as collegial, collaborative, and mutually supportive. This version of professionalism, and I, I might be able to get behind it. Um, it wasn't perfect. This particular version included a few things, such as competence uh, was guaranteed by education. We all know that's not true. Not only is that not true, it's exclusionary, but we're not expecting inclusive conversations of 1800s definitions. Um, so this is the original definition. What we do know is that by the time that we reach the 1970s and the 1980s, so we not all that long ago, um, we started to see the definition take a turn. Um, it became a great deal more sinister. Uh, and why don't we look at the two definitions side by side and compare? So in the 1800s, um, professionalism, like we said, was collegial, cooperative, and mutually supportive. On the 1970s to 80s side, we see that it, is, it, it starts to become a tool of dominance, um, starting from uh, the top going there. Additionally, we see that in the 1800s, it was initially constructed from within. So uh, what that means is that the occupational that we are talking about in whatever context were the ones that through their experience, expertise, um, and knowledge base were the ones that defined what professionalism was for themselves. This was uh, really successful. Um, imagine as professionals that we are trusted with defining our professionalism. Uh, on the other side, in the 1970s and 80s, what we see is that it starts to be constructed from above. So that means that these definitions are taken out of the hands of uh, those that are living it and experiencing it and doing it, and are put in the hands of the managers, the supervisors, um, and the, the heads of their, their companies. And what we know um, is that when definitions start being created by those that are not living that thing, um, it gets warped, and often through a point of view that is not applicable and often harmful. On the other side, so we're talking about how uh, when the group, when the practitioners are defining their professional themselves, we see that um, there are benefits for the workers and for all of the groups that they serve because this is based on knowledge and experience and expertise. On the other side, when decisions are taken out of the hands of practitioners and brought uh, above, the filters the, uh, that they're putting these definitions through start to be based on money, start to be based on the bottom line. Um, and when that is the case, uh, what we end up seeing is that organizational objectives replace occupational control um, by the practitioner. What we see is that our client work, our interactions, um, all get limited by the discretion of our supervisors and not the people that are doing the day-to-day -day work. And this undermines, uh, really the surface, the, the ethics of which practitioners are leading their engagement with each other, as well as with the, the people that they serve, whether that's clients, which is often the case for us, but also people in their organization. Some of the unspoken rules um, of modern professionals so these are the things that start taking place when that control is taken from the practitioners. How about everything is awesome? That's a Lego movie. Uh, everything is awesome. This is not true, but this is certainly how we're expected to show up in the workplace, really in life. Like, uh, workplace, yes, but often in other places in our life. But today we're So everything is awesome. Uh, how about there's no emotion in the workplace? Uh, there are no problems in the workplace. There's no life outside the workplace. We know that none of these things are true. We also know that 
this, this list is super tiny. Um, it doesn't even scratch the surface of how these, these rules tend to impact uh, how people of the vocal majority. Um, it, it doesn't talk about how it impacts just the way that we are able to show up and do our very best work if we are having to uh, participate in this like joint this like, community theater uh, together at, at all times. So we talked about some of the, the rules, let's talk about some of the unintended consequences. Um, so a, a lack of connection. We are essentially erecting walls between us and ourselves and between us and our clients. Um, we see a lot of project team burnout. Uh, we're all walking on eggshells together and that does not lead to our most dynamic or um, creative work. There's a lack of psychological safety for ourselves, for our teams. There's no space for human error or being human at all and that works very closely to psychological safety for the audience. Um, we'll do that, we'll talk about that later. About how a lack of psychological safety affects our teams. Um, you cannot speak candidly with your clients, your boss, your teams, or yourself. How can we do good work? How can we be people of integrity? Which is not always what they're asking, but how can we be people of integrity when we cannot speak honestly about the work that we're doing every day? And then experiments are risky business, and our businesses are often not in the business of being risky. Um, in the work that we do in particular, we are highly experimental, and if we cannot do that, what innovation are we tanning out for when we get started? Uh, so essentially, we're, we're feeling disconnected from each other, we're feeling disconnected from ourselves, and so much of our life is in the workplace that this kind of disconnection has, um, has a cost. What we're talking about today is that um, what we're seeing is that the landscape is changing. We're seeing that days of emotions, professionalism are, it's starting to be a thing more and more in the past. In the past. Attracting our ideal clients, building long-lasting relationships with our clients, with our stakeholders, with each other. Um, it consists of being open and authentic in a way that attracts the same from others. So, we are already seeing the shedding of these professional personas that we've all put on since we entered the workforce at whatever age I was. Um, and certainly COVID hurtled us light years forward, um, right? We could only pretend that we weren't human when we had babies on our backs and we had dogs barking in the background. Um, the world fell apart, but it didn't fall apart for all of the reasons that we were taught like wearing shorts at work. We're not buttoning our buttons to the top. And so what we learn um, through that worldwide shared experience is that traditional professionalism is a way that we're tired of caring. Despite everything that we were told to, to the contrary, business did not end when these changes started taking place. And instead, what we found was a new reality where we were finally being seen as imperfect, and that was okay. We were finally being seen as human. That was all right. And we finally found an answer to the this, this, this disconnection that we were, had been experiencing for so long and also contributing to. So the answer is authenticity. Um, so here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that it's time that we bring ourselves back to workplace. It's time that we lead with authenticity to the betterment of ourselves and our current relationships. And something that we're going to talk about is how do we layer authenticity, authentic emotion uh, into our communication to build a more trust with clients and with families. So authenticity and emotion as tools for change. So this is a Renee Brown quote, I don't know if have any Renee Brown fans, but it says, um, this is from Darren Brady. So I changed that first word, because it's a little over here. But, so he's saying, authenticity is not weakness, our willingness to own and engage with our authenticity determines the depth of our courage 
the depth of our courage, and the clarity of our purpose. So what we're talking about today is how authenticity begets authenticity. Uh, how being honest and showing emotion gets our counterparts to say things the same. We're also talking about how our business personas can be close to never before to who we truly are. Uh, we have to let go of the things that we were taught, uh, coming up about being professionals. We have to learn to harness our emotional reactions, our responses, and our communications for the good of our projects, for the good of our clients, for the good of our teams. And it's a bit of a chicken in the egg. We all want to feel safe to bring ourselves before we bring our true selves into any situation, much less work. Um, but as I said, it's chicken in the egg because really others are feeling the same. Um, so how can uh, we take baby steps to be a little bit brave uh, to bring some of ourselves and invite others to, to do the same? COVID may have pushed us a little too far in some aspects. I'm sure we all have some examples of moments that maybe we need to uh, forget. Um, but as we level set, what we're finding is that we can bring more of ourselves than ever. And let's talk about how we do that. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to let go of the notion that emotions are for who we are. And find the idea that emotions can have a layer of authenticity to all of our emotions. Um, emotional response is a layer that can better the way that we communicate with others. And so what does that look like? So an example would be what I talked about in the beginning. Um, I had the ability to completely breeze past my mental health. Um, instead, I chose to engage uh, with the client so that we can find common ground and move forward together. And that's often what our clients are looking for. It doesn't mean I need to tell her the nitty gritty of her birth, birth story. We didn't, we didn't even have that conversation. We didn't have to, I didn't have to tell her all of my personal business. But what, it, what you do instead is you find common ground. And then your partners in that communication, and you can walk the path forward as partners. Authenticity and emotional response can also deepen our connections. So what we put out, we, we receive. It has a humanizing effect, um, and this is really imperative um, because traditional professionalism, really what it did was strip away everything human about us. Um, they wanted us to see that it wanted us to dress the same, look the same, talk the same, behave the same. And so what we're doing here is we are actively pushing against that and choosing a different path. This practice also positively impacts psychological safety. Um, and in turn, that really helps us uh, be more innovative in our work. And then when we are more innovative, that has a, a really wonderful snowball effect because it impacts those around us as well. We become more innovative, those around us are inspired to become more innovative. Um, and then as a team, we're just, we're just doing better and uh, deeper work. So emotion adds color to the way that we see and communicate with each other. So emotion is a tool for good. Uh, a strategic revealing of emotion can add layer of clarity to our communications. It can express our thoughts and concerns better than words alone. And genuine emotion is part of authenticity. And authenticity is integral to the building, building foundation, a foundation of trust with those and those with those that Building a foundation of trust with those that we interact with. So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, we had a, in a previous mission, we had the largest strategic retainer, a major site that we were keeping running for uh, this client. Fantastic client, we were working for years. Um, they had some organizational trade changes, and they had, they had an edit that said they needed to cut our, it wasn't just us, but our particular contract by over a third. I think it was something like 36% we needed to put our contract by. This was a major site. It wasn't like our backlog was filled with just like really fun, fluffy stuff for us to just try and see what landed. Uh, we had a lot of work to do to maintain the stability of their site on a regular basis as part of a much larger ecosystem that we existed. So ideally, for a lot of reasons, 
the better outcome actually would have been to increase the team size, increase the amount of time that we had to accomplish this work together. Uh, but instead, they were coming to cut the contract significantly. The usual professional response would be a professional smile, say we're here, we're going to get this done for you, and then go back to the virtual break room and say, what are they thinking? Or there's no way that this is going to be successful. What I didn't say was I allowed that emotion to show. So we let curiosity and we allowed that to show us time. So one of us, the first question was, do you have a staff in place that will that to support this level of drop off? The answer was no. We knew the answer was no. We needed them to know the answer was no. They said no. And it said, okay, are you willing to bring on staff? We can help train them, we can help do this, X, Y, and Z to get them to where they need to be. No. We have to cut the 36%. And this is where layering in authentic response can help convey uh, better than words can describe. Because we could say, like a robot, we'll do what we can, bring it back to you with the plan, and we leave. Instead, what you say is you say, first, lead with empathy. I am so sorry that you were in this position. And show it. Saying that I advise what you're going through, can you imagine if you tell somebody you're having a hard time with that? What does that, what does that do for you? Or just saying, someone saying, I am so, I'm so sorry that you are the one that, that is in this position. That alone sets the foundation of, of partnership. I see you, I see what you're going through. And being seen is probably one of the number one things humans are looking for. The second thing I said was, I'm concerned. And I want to make sure that I say that out loud. I'm concerned that we're working on some things that are integral to the, the structural stability of your website and the important work that you do. That said, we're partners. We're going to go back and come up with some plans. We want to be excited for this question. What we ended up doing was we came up with two options. One that got them to their goal, and we put in big bold letters, not suggested. And we actually gave them a list why. We do not suggest this. These are the things at risk if you go in this direction. But if, it's, if, if your number one goal is to get to your, your reduction of 36% of this contract, just do it. It will hurt. hurt. This is how it will hurt, but this will do it. Our second one cut it off at 18%. And this was doable. They lost some things. It still hurt. But their side wouldn't be in jeopardy. Suggested, bold letters. And then we met with them to talk about it. We sent a list ahead of the meetings and we wanted you to, to read through this first and let's talk about it together. The meeting again, we need to have a lead. No matter what you choose when you walk away today, we are your partners. We have been since the beginning, we will continue to be. And we will support you in any way possible. We explain the pros and cons, let them make the decision. They chose the 18 percent In the end, uh, all of the structural engagements, all the structural changes they were going through the organization, it didn't mean that it was the engagement. I'm going to say about a year later, uh, we, we saw it on the horizon. It wasn't about us. Business has changed. Churn happens. Um, but boy, did we have a set up party. And it was on Zoom, but every person we ever worked with in that company came. Over the years. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? If they were still in the company, they showed up. I mean, we had seen in two years to say goodbye, to say we were sorry to, sorry to go. And those relationships last forever. And if you wonder, there's work again. We're top of mind. Not just because we're doing jobs, of course we are. But because we, we did the work, we built the trust, we were authentic when it mattered. So the consequences of showing up like never before. We build trust and honesty into the foundation of all our relationships. Our clients and colleagues do not have to guess at our intentions. This one is major. Um, I don't know about y'all, since 2020, TikTok has been teaching me more about myself than any book or therapist I've ever had. And one of the things I always struggled with was I work very hard to make sure that my words mean what I mean. And I didn't understand that people apply perception, their own perception, their own lives on top of the words I was saying. I was very confused and couldn't understand me. Uh, those are the words I said. When we lead with authenticity and integrity, when we are clear and honest, what we get is the benefit of positive intent. 
And boy, does that make a huge difference in conversations that get sticky and convoluted and difficult. Um, clear communication means less and less opportunities to provide value. And clients feel seen and safe with us. And both of those things are very important. One of the, one of my notes here talks about project teams that retro with clients. So we often retro with our teams. Something that we saw um, is that when the project team also retros with the client, so they create opportunities to be authentic, to be candid, um, with integrity, with each other, we saw a huge shift. Clients, were, they felt safer, they were more satisfied uh, with our engagement. We feel safe enough to say no when they bring something that to us that's a bad idea, and they feel safe to text their no to me, no. And that we're doing it for the right reasons. So that would be an example of a fantastic consequence of shifting uh, the way that we What does the ability to be authentic in the workplace mean to you? I would love a little, little participation here. I'm going to give my example, the same one I always give, um, because it's easy. Um, I did not wear my hair natural until about five years ago in the workplace. I was taught that curly hair was unprofessional. And this is not exclusive to black women. Um, I went to work in the workplace, it was one of the first times I wore my hair natural work, and a Jewish woman came up to me and said, oh my God, um, you have empowered me to wear my hair. She grew up at a time where her mother literally put her head on an iron board. Um, so that's me. The, my pre the previous position I held was the first time in my life I went to an interview with this year. I was taught I would not get a job. Unless my first Um So that's me. I clearly have not turned back. I'm very these days. Um, does anybody else have a similar experience? Or a similar? Yes. Um, I used to be so aggressively private at work that they basically knew my first and last name and the fact that I worked there, um, which is a very alienating experience if you're my co worker because it's like, what's wrong with her? Because that's, you know. So now I feel more empowered as I've got all the other a lot of my career to share information about myself, like anything that I do on the weekends or the tasks that I like the most. And I've had a much easier time working within my teams and much stronger relationships. So I went from being a high performer when I go to network to I was like being a high performer that has you know workplace connections and a uh, network outside of this community. That's that's my authenticity. No one told me I had to do that by the way. There's no societal. I just had this thing. No. Society told you you didn't have to do that. I, I promise you. We never know who they are, but we all get the same goals. That's a beautiful example. Thank you. You want to? No pressure. I can talk for everyone. <laughs> Um, I used to be the worst kind of mix between you two, actually. I was aggressively uh, private, 
but then I would fit my brain with them. And so you went from thinking I was my real person to knowing entirely too much about my fourth grade teacher, Miss Tyson. <laughs> and then I would, I would think about it uh, with, in my mental health group, right, with my therapist, for like weeks, oh, why did I do this? And you just have to the point where we're all human, it happens. And oh my goodness, are there worse stories than any story I personally hold? Um, why am I letting this thing come back? Anyone else? Sorry, her quote says, 
What motivates people are the bonds and loyalty and trust they develop between each other. What matters is the mortar, not just the bricks. Margaret Heffernan talks a lot about the dynamics of our project teams. Uh, she has been C-suite level in different tech companies for a very long time, and she talks about building trust, technological safety, and how it has impacted the growth and success of our teams. Uh, what we're talking about here is using some of this knowledge to talk about how we hone in our best clients. This quote in particular, when I think about the bricks, um, I think about why our clients chose us at face value, so that maybe things like my notes as street cred, so uh, the reputation, the fine reputation of whatever uh, agency that we work for, uh, perhaps even our key processes are our proposed approach to the work that they're trying to accomplish, often it has a lot to do with the way that we have priced it and what they are capable of. Uh, the mortar, it's really, when I think about that, it's the connections that we begin to build with our clients, that, and that tips the scales on how they choose to, to work with us and when they choose to continue to work with us. Uh, it took that scale in our favor in the beginning, and then we continue through these tools and, and also our good work to contribute to the health and longevity of that client website. So a foundation of authenticity benefits us all. So when we're showing up, we, when we show the world who we are, we become more attractive to those who are like us. Like attracts like. Clients don't know what they don't know and they know. They are looking to us. Uh, it's an incredibly vulnerable position. They're coming to us with a bunch of money, and they're saying, I know there are things I don't know. I know you know them. I need you to tell them to me. Um, we need to make sure they feel safe uh, doing that. Uh, our showing up as authentic, our authentic selves, uh, being authentic being human gives them the license to do the same, and this builds that foundation of trust um, it eases the initial stress that comes with that, that large uh, investment. Our ability to work as true partners with clients is predicated on our ability to be on common ground. And this is exactly what uh, showing up as ourselves, as humans, and all of our greatness uh, does. There are lots of clients that may want to work there if they're already on the team. Those are not our actual clients. Um, I'm sure that we can all think of some. I, whenever I say that sentence, I literally have logos that pop up in my head. Um, how did you feel being on a project like that? How did anybody feel about being on a project like that? Um, and how quickly do you see your teammates not want to be on projects like that? So implementing these kinds of tools, these mindsets, can help us attract what we're putting in. So the finale of the story I started in the beginning. Um, I dropped the facade with that client. I think I, in previous talks I named her Susan. I don't even know if I said her name this time, but so I'm talking to Susan and Dr. Facade. What ended up happening was we had three to five minutes, and I say this because I didn't take over the entire conversation with my new mom goals. But we had three to five minutes of true connection. I was able to reset. I was able to show that I'm human. I'm going through real things. Exciting, but real things. Um, and I was able to re-engage, and so was she. There was also a noticeable shift in our relationship after that conversation. She was a mom, I was a mom, her kids were much older, but it brought her back to that moment. And it's not the reason we talked, we talked about babies, although people love twins, I remember. <laughs> so that before we went. Um, but it was that we were on common ground. And so instead of walking in a direction together, we were walking together. Uh, we talked a little bit about my newfound sugar addiction, that was brand new. It was little things like that that just humanized the relationship on both sides. And then I was like, going to bring the, the conversation back to feedback. And I will actually say I got very clear feedback from her because she felt safe to give it. And that starts with making her feel safe, extending safety to her. So when we're able to be candid and sincere in those conversations, starts the very beginning and how we build the foundation of that relationship. Uh, what we see is that we're also able to excel and we're given great opportunities to improve as we go. So how can we be the change? So here are some small things that uh, we're going to take with us today. 
So we're going to be honest here, policy is like selling pipe dreams. So in this case, I'm talking about we should need to stop selling work we can't actually deliver. Um, we want to stop building the plane and refining it. I'm learning that about the port action box in space. So uh, that's step one. That's not always easy depending on where you work. Um, also, some of us have an immense ability, a fantastic ability to figure it out. That's what I'm talking about. If you can figure it out, figure it out. We want to stop selling lies, essentially. Uh, set goals and expectations early and often and be quick to change them when things change. Things will change all the time, constantly. That's part of the reason most of us work for agile organizations. That's why most tech companies are trying to get our gov clients to work uh, with more agile processes. Um, we need to pivot and pivot often, but we want to be clear as to when and why that's happening. So we want to communicate often. Clients should never be caught off guard. Um, when we can help it and how can we can help it. So part of our agile journey is, is to communicate, or communicate early and often. Um, often, we as project teams have done this enough that we can see the calamity coming. Um, our clients should learn about it when we do. Um, preferably we we'll plan for how we're going to do it. We're going to address it. Uh, we want to model the behavior uh, that we want to see and give those around us permission to do the same. And then this last one is very much a practice of privilege, but we don't want to work with people that we don't respect. And I say that very specifically, it's not about working with people you don't like. It's like how we follow us, but it's about respect. We don't have to like each other to have a very simple working relationship, but we certainly should be able to start with our nation respect. Okay, so then we're going to practice, practice, practice. So I began this talk by revealing uh, something about myself that I have done with and how I manage it. Um, I'm guessing all of you can relate, whether your stories contain children or some other aspect of your humanness. Um, I helped prime you to receive the message that I was sharing. Um, and so those are the things I want you to think about in your communication as well. So we want to look for safe places to try this. Maybe start with the clients that you already have really good rapport with. Uh, clients, colleagues, friends. Feel free to start at home. Uh, and we want to start small, and we just want to be a little bigger. That's it. I think I'm at about that time. So I would love questions, I would love conversations, but maybe we'll power outside this, uh, this story we're done. Thank you guys so much.